what sinner name? If that which we call a rose by any other would smell just as sweet, then what about war? What does that smell like? And would I be able to handle its stench any more if it were called a rose? How about if I called it hell? How well would your nose hold your stomach if my tongue chose to plummet its name as low as it can go? What about a waste? How does that taste? It's tough to consider, isn't it? Yet war has defaced our mouths for so long that our lips have forgotten how to check with our ears and minds to discover what's behind the words we find. I mean, we all talk about the world war without even wondering where the word war comes from. Because it would seem no one really wants to take responsibility for its origins and who can blame them? If you ask the Romans, it was named Bellum. The similarity to bello, the Latin word for beautiful, not accidental, it was considered an art form. Hence why some say it was changed when facing the barbarians, because they did not follow the careful forms, tactics and structures that had deemed it worthy to be synonymous with beauty. Opting instead for the perceived as ugly proto-Germanic word vero, from where the modern German verwirren is derived with the same meaning still applied, which was to confuse, and seems a far more adept use for defining, because if you wish to perplex, try declaring war because it makes no sense, and if you want to look at other potential cognates and derivations, we can go right back to Proto-Indo-European, because even as early as 3,500 BC, that definition agrees with their appellation for war, theirs, meaning to mix up which isn't a huge jump to the old English term, versa, and also led to our modern word for worse. So with just a quick terse but loose layman's look at some possible points of birth one can see, even its etymology proves throughout history there can be very little beauty in war, it serves only to confuse, and it is the worst of all we can be and do, so... To anyone still calling it the Great War... You should try walking a mile in one of the soldier's shoes. With the weight of 88,000 allied lives on your back, because that's how many were lost for every mile gained through the Battle of the Somme's attack. And I'm aware that figures vary greatly due to the greatness of the figures involved. And the figures involved made sure the maths was impossible. But we can do the sums, because we have to. They're one of the only ways that stand a chance of us guaranteeing any greatness revolved and wound into the stories told devolves proportionately to the greatness of souls they sold, so I can't help but feel calling any war great. It's just a little cold. In fact, I even dispute the name World War I too because I view every war as a world issue. A world of humans divided only by lines we decided to decide existed as arbitrary boundaries between those who walk freely and those who do not should not make oneness resisted. So if you could ignore a war just because it isn't on your doorstep, I think somewhere along the front line you forgot that that which we have isn't an entirely accurate lot of that which we have earned. And being born into a war zone is never deserved, so as fellow humans I feel we are if not compelled, then at least urged to purge such waste of worth. But I suppose... The First World War was the first time responsibility could not be shirked. Because for the first time it came into our homes, arranged our kitchen cupboards, redesigned our wardrobes, dug up our gardens, pruned our lower branches and leaves, bit at our bark, leaving our family trees exposed. It invaded our roots, crossed out our chromosomes, leaving them like final kisses goodbye, excommunicating with no way of asking why. So how to reply? Well, you know the score. All waged war and raged on for, unlike before, we couldn't ignore it. We fought over ownership of land like we can never really own land, and a phrase like the homeland could jerk the tear gland with thoughts so grand of tea, ticker tape parades and bandstands, cheering crowds and waving hands, not dissimilar to foreign brands, yet still somehow so separate through something as simple as a line drawn in the sand. But people will build castles and play kings, and the tide will sweep in and all will fall to sea. If only it didn't take a war to see. The space between us where the waves crashed strongest that we correctly called no man's land was ironically truly the only place where every man could stand. 
Take the armistice at Christmas in 1914, when a rising of our sons, even after night time had come and gone, even after orders to separate from one back to ones meant nothing could overcome the beauty of realising that fraternising with the enemy felt more natural than fighting them could ever be. Or in 1916, when Private Billy McFadgen dived on two live grenades that had unfortunately fallen into his trench in order to save the surrounding soldiers, his fellow comrades. Presented with the VC, posthumously. The highest and most prestigious award for gallantry, but in the face of the enemy? That's another misnaming, passing, blaming, seeing as the grenades were from Britain and were knocked by accident from the crate they were sitting in. Now, if that isn't a statement about the enemy within, I don't know what could be. But one cannot question Billy's or the soldiers who laid down their festive weaponry's bravery. I guess it just goes to show that, named or anonymous, whilst individually we can all feel helpless, all feel weakness when weak knees meet needs with meekness, one cannot deny this. That even in conditions most inhospitable, collectively the human spirit is indomitable. But still, even with that proved, again, it's a shame it had to be through war. Do we really need to be fighting to know what's worth fighting for? And don't get me wrong, I mean no disrespect to those who fought. There were the unfortunate souls caught up in an impossible affray. One that no words, worlds, or greatness can ever change, not even with its name. And maybe that's the point. What's in a name? All the evidence is there and will forever remain, so I'm not saying that the war should be forgot. But I hold hope one day we move far enough away that its horrors like Kipling's nameless soldiers will only be known unto God.